catch on real quick. This is not hard. church we just expect everybody to know is that Advent is the four weeks before Christmas. It's the time when we prepare and we hear John the Baptist talk about preparing the way. And so we have this Advent wreath and, and I've always wondered what the real significance of this thing is. We light a candle the first week, we light two the third, second week, three the third week, fourth, and then on Christmas night we light the fifth one. And finally I got an answer to that. Is every week the light of the light gets brighter until we have the brightest light when Christ is born. And so it makes sense to me when we look at it that way. Now I know they're called the peace candle and the love candle and the hope candle and all that other stuff, but that stuff is really a construct that was done later on. But the significance is that we're gonna to continue to increase the light as we move along toward Christmas. So we're gonna start off tonight with the reading from Malachi, which if you know the Bible well, you know it's the last book in the Old Testament. Um, it has a lot of interesting prop prophetic things that it said, and then we're reading tonight in the, in the third chapter. See, I'm sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he's like a refiner's fire, like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleased to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Let's pray. Gracious God, as we come into this place, we leave a world that's in a mess. We live in a time right now during Advent when the commercialization of Christmas, the hullabaloo and, and hubbub of shopping and gift delivery, it's not better this year, it's even worse because of a, of a, of a supply chain problem. And we get all focused on that. We, we forget that the reason that God came, the reason Jesus came, was to save the world. And it's that Savior that came to save the world that we believe is the great physician, the great healer, 
And it's not that he can just heal us physically, but he can also heal all of the things that are disrupted in the world. But God, he needs, we know that you need us. So forgive us for the times when we fall short, when we come to worship or, or read your text and we get all excited about following Jesus and then we go out in the world and get caught up in the noise. Tonight, help us to block the noise out and just be here with you so that we can appreciate and experience the power of your healing and amazing grace to heal us from our afflictions, from our sins, from the troubles of the world and make us part of the body of Christ as we go out into the world when we leave this place. It's in Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so in Advent, we talk about the coming of Christ. So we're going to sing, I want to walk as a child of the light. Oh, we're going to sing that together. And you can remain seated if you want. Or if you don't want, you can stand up. I've lost my hand. There it is. If you're able, would you stand as we sing Star Child together? You'll see why it's my favorite Christmas song. It describes us all. Yeah. 
wanting more. Wise child, faith child, knowing joy in store. This year, this year, let the day arrive when Christmas comes for everyone, everyone alive. Hope for peace, child, God's stupendous sign. Down to earth, child, star of stars that shine. This year, this year, let the day arrive when Christmas comes for everyone, everyone alive. Amen. Isn't that a neat song? Yep. I just love it. If you would uh, remain standing for just a few moments as I read from the Gospel. We're going to be reading the Gospel of Luke. It's in the third chapter. In the 15th year of the reign of Imperius, in the emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip of the region of Ature and Traconius, and Licinius ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Amen. And you may be seated. Amen. So this message is about preparing the way. And I think so many times we forget of what a, what a big deal God made about preparing the way. John the Baptist was uh, very different than Jesus. Uh, he was a gruff guy. Uh, he was... Uh, he was really gruff. Most people would be really uncomfortable being around John the Baptist. I, I uh, years ago, used to do chapel for the kids at the other church I served. And I tried to, you know, the, the scriptures tell us that John the Baptist ate locusts. Well, you know, when you're talking about preschoolers, they don't know what a locust is. Some of us don't really know what a locust is. We know what a cicada is. That's close. But a locust was really kind of a grasshopper that wiped out the crops. And, and John the Baptist ate them. They were protein, and he was living in the wilderness. So mistakenly that day, I explained that, you know, it was kind of like a bug, much like a roach. And so I got a call later that day and said, John the Baptist did not eat roaches. Uh, but the whole idea that, that God is preparing us for something, and I think that's still true today. I think, you know, you say, well, wait a minute. Jesus came 2,000 years ago. That's all the story's over. I, I don't think it is at all. I think the, the story is like any other play that it just has a part one and a part two and a part three. And, and, and we are not yet at the end. And, and the way you'll know it is the end is when the author of the play comes on the stage. And that's what we would talk about in Revelation or, or in the times when Christ comes back. But in the meanwhile, we're preparing the way for something. And so uh, I was at a meeting yesterday for a group that I'm in that it was the 125th year of their existence. And it became glaringly apparent to those of us there that in 1896, things were different than they are in 2021. And if it wouldn't have been for them preparing the way, and I would say the same thing about those people that started this church back in the 30s, if it wouldn't have been for somebody preparing it, getting us ready, we couldn't be here today. But that's not the end of the story because we're to prepare it for somebody else. And, and I think sometimes in AA we get that, right? You get the 12th step after having gotten the message, then I carry the message to others. But that's exactly what God has asked us to do. He, he gave, gave us the example. John came to introduce us to Jesus. Jesus came to introduce us into new life. And now we're supposed to be introducing others into that. And how do we do that? Well, 
that there's a there's a, a commitment level, right? Everybody in this room has at some time in their life, I, I suspect, and if not, we can talk if you need to, but but has everybody has given their life to Christ in some shape, form, or fashion. They've gone to the front of a church or they've maybe quietly at home or some other time they've said, God, you know, I turn my life and will over to you. Well, we've taken a solemn oath, we have, all of us. And we have the same one and we're on the same team. And we're on the same team with the Baptist church down the street, the Lutheran church around the corner, and the Catholic church down that street. We're all on the same team. And we're out there wearing the same uniform, supposed to be changing the world with love and care, just exactly the same way those of us that have gone through AA are supposed to be sharing the message, carrying the message. Well, God knows there's a lot of people need to hear both, right? Yes. It's one thing to, to say, and it's easier, I suppose, to just say, I'm not going to drink anymore. Uh, God took that away from me when I decided to make that commitment, and, and I haven't really wanted to drink since then, but I needed to learn to live differently because had I kept on the same trajectory, the trajectory is going to lead me back to the same behaviors that I had before. That's right. I, I, I think about it this way. I, you know, for, for four years, I rode around in a squad car when I was a police officer. Most of the time, a lot of it by myself. I was listening to the radio you know, because we had radios in the squad car, usually listened to some country station most of the time in those days. And, uh, and I rode around, you know, what is really, you know, many of you won't believe this, a pretty boring job. Uh, it's not like Adam 12 and the other stuff on TV where you just get one call after the other after the other, except maybe on the Friday night when it's a full moon. But for the most part, it's a kind of a boring job. Lots of paperwork. Lots of times you decide not to do something because you'd have to write paperwork. And I'm pretty confident that if you gave me the keys to a squad car and you put me back out riding around by myself for eight hour shifts in the middle of the night, I'd be stopping somewhere to buy a pack of cigarettes and going back to the behaviors I had then because that's the, that's the, the, the DNA of what I did when I did that. So, and, and, and now I'm sure this is true in, in TOPS and other groups as well. What we have to learn is it's not just about not doing what we did. It's finding a way to do it different. And, and I, I don't think that's talked about as, not, uh, as much as it might should be in the Christian world. We come up and we profess our belief in Jesus, but then we go out and we live the same way that we did before. We tell the same stuff. We hang out with the same people. You know, Jesus gave us the example when, when you may remember this story, but he was speaking in a house somewhere and they knocked on the door and whatever doors looked like there. And they said, well, your mom and your brothers and sisters are outside. And he said, no, 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 y'all are my brothers and sisters. And so, you know, to boil it down real simply, just exactly like in AA, you have to change your play places, playmates and play things. That's true in the Christian world, too. There's some places we ought not want to go. There's some behaviors we ought not to participate in. That's right. And when everybody starts to talk to me about the disgust for the way the world is right now, I think we're complicit in it because the stuff we don't agree with or approve of is sponsoring the TV shows that we're watching and we're buying the products that they say and we're not checking out what they really stand for. Now, more people do it a little bit now. They look for grass-fed beef or organic food, I suppose. But we should care what the morals are of the companies that are providing the stuff that we buy. You know, I don't know what a new pair of Nikes cost today, but they're expensive. A hundred bucks, huh? You guess it? More than that? I'm, I'm just, I'm looking for help here. 150 to 200. Okay, so, so a pair of nine, what do you think the guy that made them makes? A bowl of rice. Yeah, should we care? Yeah. I mean, we should care. We should buy right? blue. And so, so I think that when, when we start to look at what, if Christians are going to change the world, we should start to care about the other stuff. About 20 years ago, the Methodist Church, uh, we have a book of resolutions, which they're not rules we have to follow. They're great suggestions. It's not like the Great Commandment, right? They're suggestions. And this, guy, this, this group of people protested that uh, a, a Mexican food, fast food place was buying uh, salsa from a place where people were being really mistreated. And so they said, we should boycott Taco Bell. Well, first of all, it wasn't popular, so nobody talked about it. And secondly, we didn't do it. And so I think, 
I look back on the history of the church, not just our church, but the church, the things that were set forth by the Puritans and the people that we just celebrated Thanksgiving, the first settlers of this country, they had strict rules about what you could and couldn't do. And over the years, we've diluted them and diluted them and diluted them and diluted them so that now almost anything goes. And that's, we're products of that. You know, I, I, I think, uh, I mean, it really is, when I, was, when I sold farm equipment, which I did for about, I don't know, six, seven, eight years, uh, I was working at Beaumont, and uh, I was still drinking in those days. And so I worked with predominantly rice farmers. And so the rice farmers were big on beer that was made with rice. And I admire that because that was their living, right? It was the rice, and so they wanted to, to make sure that when they look at the ingredients on the can, rice was one of the, the ingredients. I'm not telling you which brands it is. I'm not, I'm not advertising for the beer companies today. But, but I think that's the kind of thing I'm talking about here. Do we know who made the stuff? Do we care about the situation that the people were in or not? And so when I think we're preparing the way, we're raising a generation of kids right now. And are we teaching them that stuff? Or are we teaching them the world's economy where you get what you want when you want it the way you want it? The claim is that those of us that are baby boomers had parents that gave us anything we wanted. It didn't work for me. <laughs> I didn't get everything I wanted. But, but, but that's the claim, that we were spoiled kids. But in fact, there is some truth that the parents that we had that lived through the Depression did make a little bit of an extra effort to make sure that we didn't have to live like they did. And in some ways, that spoiled child that we just sang about, yeah, that's us. And so I think when we start to talk about what it means to understand these scriptures that were written so long ago about John the Baptist and Jesus, the message hasn't really changed. What God is saying to us in Advent in 2021 is that we are called to prepare the way for a new generation of people. And that has to be done by teaching and showing them what love really looks like. And, you know, love, I'm not talking about we love the Astros or we love the Texans. I'm talking about the kind of love that transcends people. For example, those kids that had parents that are incarcerated. It's not the kid's fault. They deserve to be appreciated by somebody. And if we can intercede and make that appreciation look like it's coming from the parents, it may change everything for that family. Now, I know one time we were delivering those kids. We, we deliver the ones that don't come pick them up. And there was a lady that wouldn't have any part of it. She said, I don't want my kids having anything to do with that guy that was in prison. And she probably had good reasons for that. But that's not a person that believes in repentance or restoration or redemption. And I think we are people that should be practicing redemption. When, when, when there's a person out there that needs a second chance, Christians ought to be the first ones to give it to them. That's right. Now, it doesn't mean you do it with your eyes closed. Right? If they were arrested for embezzlement, we probably don't put them in charge of the money. Right. <laughs> you know. If they if they have some kind of a, of a of a sex crime, we probably don't put them in charge of the children's ministry. Right. But it doesn't mean we throw them out, because if anybody can save them, it's the it's Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can. He can turn their whole life around. And and proof of that is this prison ministry that do. Charles Colson was part of the Watergate thing. Went to prison. He was in prison. He was a smart guy. He looked around and said, I wonder how God can do something here. And had he not gone to prison, I don't believe prison ministries would exist today the way it does. So out of, you know, you've heard it said in, in, in the secular world, you got lemons, make lemonade. But we take those experiences and our strength and our hope and we move those into the future instead of hanging on and clinging to the past. I... I know that, that uh, you know, I experience that all the time when people say, well, you know, I, don't, I just don't get a break. Well, you've got to keep trying until you get one. They're not guaranteed. There's not somebody sitting out there on a shelf saying, you, you, if you just pick the right one, everything will be rosy. I, I got sober. I still got fired from a job. Still got divorced. Things still didn't work out. My mom and dad still died. I mean, those, stuff, those things happen. But in spite of that, we have an opportunity, I think, to realize that we've been given the gift that never stops giving. 
We've been given the gift that can be offered to absolutely redeem somebody's life and take them from living under a bridge or whatever other conditions they have into a, a really sustainable life. But somebody sometimes has to give them a hand up. And that's a real different thing than a handout. We're in Pasadena, Texas. Let me tell you, the mentality here is, you know, grab yourself by your bootstraps and pull yourself up. Well, friends, I'm not wearing boots tonight, but I've tried that, and uh, you can't pull yourself off the ground. That's right. Somebody sometimes has to help a little bit. And so we do stuff here. We do things like that. We, we sent 11 kids to Champions Kids Camp last year, which took 11 kids out of about 200 that were there to go to a place where they could find out that their, their CPS life of parents that had abandoned them and things that were going wrong didn't define who they were. <laughs> And I think that's, that's what I think this is all about. The coming of Jesus means that you're not defined by your past. You're defined by how you, you're defined by how you serve God. And I think, you know, I, I make this statement a lot. I've seen probably more people come to Christ in an AA meeting than I have in a lot of other meetings I've been to. Because what happens is we start, to, we start off understanding what a higher power is and who our power is. If we don't get that, we'll never understand the power of Christ. Because he is the highest power. And he has the power to change everything in a blink of an eye. And he chooses to do it with us. And so we have to become the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. We have to become the ones that love. He loves everybody, but they won't feel that handshake or that welcoming uh, hug or whatever it is that we're able to give. That's only felt in, in by flesh. And so in some ways, we get to be Jesus with flesh on today. And I think that's a message that we need to hear as we move toward Christmas, especially in a world that is so consumed with itself. And, and so how do you get yourself out of that? Because we've got to live in the world, right? I, I have a friend uh, that's going to seminary. He's been a, a preacher in another denomination for some time. And uh, I was joking with him last night. I said, well, have they had you read any books? If you don't know, in seminary you read about it. I don't know, I've got a shelf full, probably 200 books in the three and a half years I was there. They're thick books, they're not exciting, they are not novels that have a great ending. But there's a few of them that are, and one of them was this book called The City of God. And, and to me, it's the thing that, that kind of makes this all make sense. You, you know, or you may not know, but the Apostle Paul was convinced that Jesus would come back in his lifetime. He, if you read the Pauls that we, the books that we know Paul wrote, you can see that clearly. He thought Jesus was coming back in his lifetime. Now, there's 13 books attributed to Paul. He probably didn't write all of them. But the ones that we know he wrote, you don't see him referring to Jesus in heaven because you think he, he understands Jesus is coming back. And, and, and so, in a way, Paul lived between the times. He knew that Christ had come, the world had been redeemed, but he was still living in a world that wasn't redeemed. So my, my, one of my professors said, you know, Paul is walking between the times. And I want to submit to you that we are too. So there is a spiritual city, the city of God, that is imposed right on the top of this one. And they're both happening at the same time. The world is doing its thing, and God's doing God's thing. And so here we are as brothers and sisters in the kingdom with the opportunity to take the city of God spiritually to people within a secular world. And that's a task. Because we're people that want proof. If you don't believe that, look at all the hullabaloo about vaccinations and all the other stuff that is going. We want proof. We want, we want it. Right. Well, find me proof of Jesus' resurrection other than some history. It's tradition. You know, nobody is... Have you seen him lately? <laughs> we can't find his bones. We can't research that. We, we can't do... We have to trust... That the stories told by these people and the stories told by the historian Josephus and others are true. And if they are true, then we have a Savior that can do more than just make things better today. But he can change the whole world. And I think that's a, an interesting task. I, I know that it, it uh, I find it fascinating that for 20 years we sent missionaries to China where it's illegal to be Christian. And they're prospering there. They're growing. The churches are growing. And now they're sending missionaries back to us because they think somehow we've diluted the message. And they might be right. The message is not about some denominational loyalty. The message is about following the Savior of the world, the one that controls your forever, your eternity. That message is totally different 
than what's going to happen to the economy next week. Now, we can't, we can't throw those things out. We have to pay attention. We've got to pay our bills and do the other stuff we do. But I can tell you, when we start to put God first, those other tasks become tasks we do to fulfill the work that we get to do for the kingdom. And so I would like for us to, as we go through this time of Advent, to, to look at preparing the way. I, I uh, had the privilege to be in, in an AA meeting one time with a bunch of men. It was a men's meeting. And there was a guy in that meeting that had been praying for his brother to come to the rooms of AA for years. For years. And he never came. And I had the privilege to be there the night he came. Now, you might wonder what kind of response they would have had. You know what they said? Is, We've been praying for you to get here all the time. They were preparing the way to be ready to accept him when the time came. And that's our task, too, is to realize that, you know, you might offer somebody Christ or sobriety, and they may not pay much attention to you, but somebody has to be the first to offer it. Many years ago, I was working in a psych hospital, and I was working in the, the intake department, and a guy, young man came in. He was an FAA-qualified pilot out at Hobby Airport. He had an absolutely gorgeous wife. They were very young, and they had everything you would want. They had money. They had everything that you'd want as a young couple. He had a great job. Now, he got a cocaine problem. And he, they came in to talk to me, and he and I talked. Me and his wife talked. And the story was different from her than it was from him. You might expect that. And it ended up with him leaving and walking out because he didn't believe he had a problem. My message to her, and, and has been to many other people since then, is that he's never going to hear you until things change on your end. So, you know, it was probably November or something when they came, and I didn't get another call until Christmas Eve. And that day, she had decided that enough is enough is enough, and she put all this stuff on the front porch and said, when you get your act straight, come home. And he called me. He said, I have nowhere to go, but I want to go to treatment. We had had that conversation months before that began to prepare the way. I want to tell you, friends, we have that same chance right now when people say, well, yeah, that church stuff. Y'all go up there. I know what y'all do. Y'all think you're self-righteous. You're better than everybody else. Anybody here believe that? I don't think so. We're not better than anybody. We just have seen some of the light that they haven't seen yet. And so our job is to reflect that light. Much like the moon reflects the sun, we're supposed to be the ones that reflect the love, mercy, and grace of Jesus Christ. I was talking to this lady from the, the AA district thing earlier, and, and, and uh, I think so many times we, we, we segment things and say, well, this is this, and this is this. i got to tell you, there is no this and this. It's all God's kingdom. And, and God has control. I, when I start the funeral service, I always read the scripture that says, Jesus says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I hold the keys to hell and death. You get that? Who's The person that has the keys has the power, right? And he has it over death, and he has it over hell, and he has it over everything else. Anything that we exist, it's God's thing. And so we need to treat it as such and have some reverence and some ability to go forth and do what he's done for us, and that's to offer love, grace, and mercy to others. It's a simple message. And in just a second, we're going to light the second candle to give just a little bit more light as we look through this time of Advent together. Michael, if you were up here, I'd have you light, but since you're down there, I'll just do it. You can light next week. Okay. So tonight, we light this candle as a symbol of Christ the way. May the word sent from God through the prophets lead us to the way of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Now we're going to sing. I don't think the, are the words in there. I think they are. No, they're not. Okay, well, then me and Leslie will sing, and you all can sing if you can figure out the words. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. Here we go. Yeah. O come, thou wisdom from on high.
and our hope for the days to come. We come before you humbly, sometimes with a little trepidation, to once again accept you, to believe that you are the King of Kings. But God, we don't come believing we're that good. We know in many ways we have failed you. Sometimes on purpose and sometimes just by omission, we haven't been the person that you created us to be. So we know that you are willing to accept us again tonight and that redemption for us all is available through you. So as we come to your table, would you make this bread and this cup become for us the body and blood of Christ? That as we take it in, as we have this experience at your holy dinner, your holy meal, your holy banquet. That we can join together on this planet right now to be the body of Christ until that come, time comes when we all join together at that eternal banquet where you preside always. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. So in the United Methodist Church, when we have communion, everybody is welcome to come. We don't ask any questions of you. We just invite you to come. And... Uh, we're doing this with our, we're still using our, I guess our COVID protocol. We'll give you a little cup with some grape juice, a little cup that has some bread in it. And uh, you are invited to come if you want to. You can always pray here at the altar rails if you so desire. Friends, the table is prepared. Come to this place for heaven and earth. Leslie's going to come first, I suspect. And then when you're finished, the, the, the utensils here are plastic. Just put them in the trash. Friends, the table is prepared. Come as you will. We have a bucket here. And this is our, our, the offering we collect on Saturday nights is in a basket in the back. But this bucket is uh, for nickels, fair, fair change, nickel dimes, quarters that you might have. And, and anything that happens during December is going to the Methodist Children's Home, which is another way we take care of kids that are on the margins. You can take it yourself. This time.
friends, we've been to the place where heaven and earth meet. We are called to go prepare the way for the coming of Christ, for life-changing experiences, for redemption of the world. Go in peace, and let's do that work of the kingdom. Amen. 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 Amen.